Hello, I'm Rosemary Hanna. Welcome to The Bahamas Then and Now, a series that deals with our history, heritage, arts, culture, and all those things that make us uniquely Bahamian. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Today we're talking with Troy Edward Clark, the leader of the National LEAD Institute that deals with challenged young men. Welcome to the show, Troy. Thank you for having me. Tell us about yourself, Troy, where you grew up and the influences on you in your young life and the things that motivated you to do the things that you are now doing to help our um, young men. Well, um, let me first start, uh, start off by saying, uh, Rosie, that uh, Troy Clark is, right now is the sum total of all of the decisions that I've made over the past 47 years, almost 48 years now. I grew up in the inner city of New Providence, Woods Alley, off Wolf Road, mm -hmm. in a, what we call a shotgun house, front room, middle room, back room. So you could see straight through from the mm -hmm. front road right to the back road. And I went to school at Oaksfield Primary. My mother was a single parent with six children. And uh, also I went, my high school was at St. Augustine's. Only kid through the corner who went mm -hmm. to a private school during that time. In my neighborhood, uh, basically, there weren't so much vices, but we had a lot of community activities. And the only vices I would have seen growing up as a young child through my neighborhood was the occasionally uh, gambling of the Haitians cross the road using clothespins mm -hmm. and every Sunday police would come and raid them out of an ambulance as such. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got into a really high school where I observed some of the vices as drugs, mm -hmm. alcohol and stuff, which I never partake in. And it was basically because of the close knitted of the community, mm -hmm. as well as the activities that I was involved with from Boys Brigade, Royal Ambassadors, I was able to get my foundation secured at a very, at a very early age. Mm -hmm. And my mother was very instrumental in my development as a young child, although she was a single parent, and as although she worked as a maid on the Eastern Road, she was still really a much a part of our homework process, our mm -hmm. schooling process, all the way through high mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. What were some of the positive things? You mentioned the Boys Brigade um, a few minutes ago and other activities that, for boys that seem to have died out now that they used to have when you were a boy. Well, um, I enjoyed going to Boys Brigade. Mm -hmm. I, I spent a short stint in First Company, which was the pen company through um, I think the corner is uh, Chapel Street, Chapel Street yes. right, where Wesley Wesley Mavis. Church. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I moved into Royal Ambassadors. And so I got a lot of my early childhood leadership training mm -hmm. in Royal Ambassadors. And I moved up to the rank of becoming president of the oh, Royal Ambassadors mm -hmm. under Arnold Farquharson and also Bernard Roll during mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. And it exposed me to a lot of biblical principles. Mm -hmm and actually coming up under Charles W. Sanders, Dr. Charles W. Sanders, mm -hmm. who was a great disciplinarian, mm -hmm. a great administrator, mm -hmm. a great leader in the Baptist faith during that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. It gave me a lot of, I say, uh, strength and knowledge and understanding about who I am at that point of time as a child growing up. So mm -hmm. basically, I think although we were poor, I, 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 would have, I, I would say I had a tremendous childhood, which was really fun. And during that time, I didn't really know that we were poor, actually. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's true. So what were some of the most, the most important lessons that you learned as a child? Well, as a child, uh, basically, I learned a lot about teamwork. I learned about values which were instilled in us, although I departed from it as a teenager to, into adulthood. Uh, a lot of values on loyalty, uh, family values, mm -hmm. 
uh, spirituality. Um, though during that time, my mother didn't go to church because she was one of the first set of children out of the Ranfley home okay. uh, when the Ranfley home first established. And, um, but she instilled that compassion, that kindness, that sense of uh, belongingness, that sense of purpose, mm -hmm. and that spirituality within our life. Mm -hmm. She made sure that we as young, um, our young kids went to Sunday school every Sunday, went to church every Sunday. Also, after church, we had to walk from Woods Alley all the way up to Lewis Street to carry food to her adopted mother, mm. who during that time as a child who they run away from, treated them so bad, but as an adult, she, she did not hold on to those kind of things, mm -hmm. but she made sure and still those kind of values mm -hmm. within us. Very, very strong values. And I guess that's what led to your becoming involved or establishing the LEAD Institute. Tell us, tell us about that and the genesis of the National LEAD Institute. The National LEAD Institute was founded in some five years ago. And LEAD stands for Leadership, Esteem, Ability and Discipline. And our mission basically is to provide programs and services for the at-risk population in the educational system, as well as re-entry programs for inmates transitioning out of correction facilities, okay. whether they are in the Bahamas or in the United States or in the Caribbean. The genesis of that came when I experienced my Damascus experience. I was at the lowest part of my life. I found myself in part of the criminal justice system. And I realized during that time that um, although I might have been innocent of any wrongdoing, I realized that there were a lot of lift services paid to young men who did not have the resiliency that I may have acquired over the years mm -hmm. to avoid drugs, to avoid alcohol, to avoid actually getting involved in, in, in criminal activities. Mm -hmm. and. I saw that as a need and because of my training in Royal Ambassadors, Boys Brigade and eventually going through the Defense Force, that discipline, I say, you know what, Troy, I, what I want to do is actually move away from what I'm doing now, making money, but move to help young men who don't have the resiliency. And I remember one day after I... Um, didn't really have a job per se. I was working for myself after I came out of the insurance company and I was reading a book called In Pursuit of Purpose or uh, The Pursuit of Purpose by Dr. Miles Monroe. And I said, you know what? I know exactly what my purpose is. And I seeked out um, Dr. Miles. And what happened was that um, I wrote the business plan for this uh, boot camp that I originally designed. Mm -hmm. Originally, when, Jeff, when I spoke with Jeff Lloyd, Mm -hmm. after coming home from university mm -hmm. and sitting down at the table the um, the name of the program would have been named the bahamas lead core and mm -hmm. so dr murner said no what we're going to do we're not going to name it the bahamas because you don't want to confine it mm -hmm. you let's name it national and so that because one day this will become international and let's name it institute mm -hmm. and so we put the name we put the name national and institute and i had the name lead and he said, okay, then I will do the forward for the business plan for you. And also, I will serve as mm -hmm. your, one of your board members. And so he was one of the founding board members of the National Aid Institute uh, through, by pulling out the resources or the passion that I had. Because when I originally went to him, I said, you know, Dr. Munro, I want to be a public um, motivational speaker. And, but I need to know what to do. This is my for-profit business that I've designed, the Destiny Group, and this is LEAD. This is the business plan mm -hmm. for LEAD. So he shared with me how he established the Bahamas Faith Ministries, and when he set that up, then other people came to him, and he shared with them what other things he needed to do. So he said, you know, Troy, LEAD is the vehicle that you would actually get to become a motivational speaker. So LEAD is the fruit, so people will come to you for the fruit of the tree once we establish LEAD. And that's how I got the genesis of the National LEAD Institute. This is really very, very interesting. And it's highly commendable that what you are doing and that you had such a great mentor. Yes. You, you mentioned Dr. Monroe and his mentorship. Uh, who were other people who would have influenced you? Well, growing up, um, I was influenced mainly by role models such as Gregory Bethel, uh, Hugh Roll, Garth Roll, 
and none other than uh, Reverend Dr. Charles W. Sanders as a young boy from primary school all the way up mm -hmm. to almost young adult at age 18. Mm -hmm. And then when I moved over, transitioning into Bahamas Faith Ministries, I went out and looked for Dr. Miles Monroe. He and Dr. Pinder became uh, my two mentors. And I don't use the word loosely as mentors because I actually enroll in the Miles Monroe uh, Leadership Mentoring Program. And therefore I completed at least three to four levels of his leadership program. Mm -hmm. And mentorship uh, took more than just reading his books, uh, trying to apply the principles to my life, but actually going through the process that Dr. Richard Pindo would have taught myself and others. And you know, where I am now, if it wasn't because of the process that was taught through Dr. Richard Pindo as a young man, and Dr. Miles Monroe mm -hmm. and his principles and his uh, purposes, I don't think I would have been here today trying or living the life of what we call a real man. That's highly commendable. Tell us about some of your successes at, um, in the LEAD Institute. Well, um, we have many uh, successes within the National LEAD Institute. Mm -hmm. The National LEAD Institute within two years became an international organization. Basically, we registered as a nonprofit within the state of North Carolina, as well as just last year, we received our 501c3 status, which is a tax exempt status within the states of, um, in, within the United States mm -hmm. of America. And so basically, we were able to train Bahamian professionals in that state with grants from the United States Embassy, as well as we were able to establish the only um, mm -hmm alternative school for boys called the Eagles Academy. And basically we have seen more than two to 300 young males oh, graduate cool. from high school over the last mm -hmm. four to five years. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it just gave my heart joy the other day when a parent uh, Facebook me, actually WhatsApp me, mm -hmm. and shared with me an acceptance letter for a university that a child who came through the wonderful. National Lead Institute got mm -hmm. a scholarship to go to mm -hmm. university in the United States. And so we have tremendous uh, stories that we can talk about all day, even inmates who have transitioned mm -hmm. out of a Majesty's mm -hmm. prison who have yet to return into a lifestyle of uh, criminal activities. And basically, LEAD has been built upon what we would say mm -hmm. some of the mistakes and some of the trials that I would have experienced. Mm -hmm. And so I would have been able to actually mentor other young men yeah through those mistakes and those trials mm -hmm. to get them to where they need to go today. This, this is absolutely wonderful. And I think that LEAD is something that um, the Bahamas needs to do more about. And what other leaders in the country are doing to help our young people. We'll talk about that more when we return. We'll be right back. You're watching the Bahamas then and now. This episode is brought to you by the Private Trust Cooperation Limited. Gwen's Alterations, Dungalik Studios, and Vodio. This is the Bahamas, 700 islands, reefs, and keys, sporting a distinct history and heritage all its own. This is New Providence, most populated, industrialized island at the center of the archipelago, home of Nassau, the capital city, seat of parliament, Location of political and social revolution, site from which our nation declared its independence. And this is Over the Hill, a community, a series of neighborhoods in what was then considered Southwest New Providence. Settled by slaves, having served as the midwife of national deliverance. Over the hill, 
a breeding ground of nation builders, constructing trait by trait, precept upon precept, character-toting, culture-shaping leaders. Over the hill, where independence was born, where the naval string of Bahamianization is buried, where Junkanoo got polished. Over the hill, where sense and sensitivity were kneaded into the dough of children's souls, where people reverently genuflected to the image of God in every man. Over the hill, East Street, Market Street, Blue Hill Road, Bain Town, Grantstown, Anderson Street, Augusta Street, to Fort Hill, MacPherson Street, Over the Hill, McCullough Corner, Hay Street, Glinton Square, where? Mason's Edition, Jail Alley, Lewis Street, Over the Hill, the Coakleys, the Smiths, the Johnsons, the Blydens, the De Stoops, the Grants, and the Coopers, the McPhersons, and the Pindlings, the Allens, and the Winders, Over the Hill, the Hannas, the Bostricks, the Burnsides, the Bethels, the Walkers, the Enuses, and the Thompsons, the McCartneys, and the Gibsons, Over the Hill. What if we went back and dug into the soil of our glorious past? And what if we studied the roots and found the patterns of Bahamian unity and success and progress and superimpose those on the social ills of Lil Nassau, the social ills of the Bahamas in general. What would happen? What would happen if we really understood where we came from? Our heritage is not ghetto. Our language is not profanity. Our resolution is not violence. We are Bahamians, kings and queens, gentlemen and ladies, athletes and warriors in every sphere, geniuses and priests, artists and leaders, and much of it started over the hill. Welcome back. Our guest today is Troy Edward Clark, the leader of the National Lead Institute. Troy, how important is leadership training for our youth today? Well, leadership training is very, very, and I must say, very important for our young people mm -hmm. today. And like in the words of John Maxwell states, um, everything rises and falls on leadership. So goes the leader, so goes the country, so goes the leader, so goes the family, so goes the leader, so goes the nation. So it is very important for us to train our young people in the art of leadership because mm -hmm. if we don't, then we will have a following society and that is not what we want. And what I have learned from my mentor, one of my greatest mentors, Dr. Miles Monroe, is that in every one of us, reside in every one of us, there is a leadership potential. Each and every one of us, uh, we are born leaders. And it's just like a diamond in the rough. What we need are mentors to actually chip away the rough edges to bring out the leadership potential mm -hmm. within us. And when we think about leadership and leadership training in our young people, we don't think about just aspiring to office or aspiring to a certain position, but we, we think about leadership uh, uh, potential as actually in the area of gifting. Mm -hmm. You have some people who are artists, some people who are musicians, some people who are, 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 are mechanics or plumbers or lawyers. They are in their area of gifting, so they need to rise to the occasion or bring that out within, from within them. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we need to find out in our young people which area of giftings are they and then actually channel them. Mm -hmm. 
and instead of just looking at a holistic view in our academic area, what we need to do is actually find out their area of gifting and channel them through that so that at the end of the day, they can actually uh, reach their maximum potential in their area of gifting. Leadership potential is very, or leadership training, mm -hmm. or leadership education mm -hmm. is paramount and mm -hmm. should be paramount mm -hmm. from a child is in primary school. If we look at the educational system in the Asian countries, they pull out their gift and their talents mm -hmm. and they actually develop those individuals and they become leaders in their sport and their arenas. They become leaders whether in the political world or they become leaders in the technical world. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have so much Asians like Indians who are in the IT area in the United yes. States because they are trained or they are developed from infant to adulthood uh, from their leadership training. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is um, needed now in the Bahamas more than anything? Well, I think we need to go back to basics. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, like Marcus Mosea Gavi says, a people without knowledge of the past is like a tree without roots. And if we don't understand where we came from, then we're going to keep on uh, committing the mistakes mm -hmm. of the past or keep on repeating mm -hmm. stuff of the past and then we're not gonna move forward successfully. Mm -hmm. So once we understand, and I always like to use these five questions, who we are, where are we from, why are we here, what can we do, and where are we going? And we call those the identity questions, and that came out of one of uh, Dr. Monroe's book. And once we can understand those questions mm -hmm. honestly and truthfully, mm -hmm. then we will help our young people to move from where mm -hmm. we are from the past to where we are present and to move towards the future. Mm -hmm. But we cannot do that by dismissing our past. Whether the past was bad, whether the past was good, we cannot mm -hmm. uh, move mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. by dismissing those. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the program, the actual program at the LEAD Institute. You know, you, you have teachers coming, I, I understand, yes. and um, how the program works. Well, the National Lead Institute is an incorporated organization, uh, basically under the Companies Act of the Bahamas. We have three major programs. One of our major programs is Project Reentry. That is facilitated within Her Majesty's Prison, or now the Bahamas Correctional Services, and we work closely with the pre-release section, the rehabilitation section, where we have a reentry class for 10 weeks, mm -hmm. every cycle or every 10 week cycle and we work with, the, with those inmates who are nearing release. They have 18 months or less transitioning out of prison. And once they come out of prison, we connect with them within 72 hours from, from the exit of the prison, and we assist them with job uh, readiness, family mm -hmm. reunification. If there are substance abuse issues, we'll assist them with what we call our new program called Moral Recognition Therapy, where we put them through group therapy as well. Our other program is our Life Monitoring Male Empowerment Program. That is in a Majesty's Prison where we work with the chaplaincy services, mm -hmm. where we work with 25 juvenile offenders who, what we call, we call this uh, pre-trial mm -hmm. uh, program that we work with these young people trying to change their mindset. Mm -hmm. And then also the other program is the life, the other spinoff is the Life Monitoring Male Empowerment Program that are in two schools this semester. T.A. Thompson and Government High School. That's very good. And then we have the Eagles Academy, which is an alternative school for the challenged males, whether they come from prison, whether they come from the Simpson Penn Center, or whether they expel or suspended out of the school system. Mm -hmm. And these programs all work together to help identify the gifting of these young men mm -hmm. and try to move them into leadership position mm -hmm. in their area of gifting. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. about the teachers and lecturers, yes, all yes. of our lecturers mm -hmm. and teachers actually are volunteers. Mm -hmm. We have them from the public health services, the prison, the defense force, who actually volunteer at least an hour or two a week, mm -hmm. and one or two retirees who come in. And also we have a math and English program that is computer-based generated. I've been to the Institute and I've seen firsthand what you're doing then. I think it's really a wonderful job that you're doing. Um, but tell us what are your future plans for the Institute? The National Lead Institute is a progressive institute and we have a three to five year vision where we are moving towards uh, moving the Institute to a what we call a fully accredited institute for those demographic or persons 
who might have gone into the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and want to come out of the criminal justice system, never committing uh, challenge activities or never committing criminal activities mm -hmm. that they might have committed mm -hmm. in the past. Lead Institute now is actually strengthening our mm -hmm. North Carolina operations. And the purpose of uh, strengthening the North Carolina operations is to raise tremendous funds because funding in the Bahamas it's is difficult. very challenging. Mm -hmm. And so we believe that if we could strengthen our North Carolina operations, that we work in the prison and the community there, and we can bring some of those technical resources, mm -hmm. some of those financial resources back to bear in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, as well as we using the North Carolina operations to train practitioners mm -hmm. here in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas so mm -hmm. that they can come back to the Bahamas and actually utilize evidence-based mm -hmm. programs. Also, uh, we're using the North Carolina as a hub to visit Bahamian inmates who are incarcerated in federal penitentiaries or correction okay. facilities That's around the United mm -hmm. States to co connect them with their families back here mm -hmm. in the Bahamas. And we're going to do a need assessment. We're going to do what we call a treatment plan for these individuals. So that time they come back to the Bahamas, they come in a structured evidence-based program mm -hmm. so that they can assimilate effectively back into their communities. And we are moving towards what we call a Caribbean Correctional Conference. And we hope to partner with our longtime partner, the United States Embassy, the Ministry of National Security, so that we can train persons from not only in the Bahamas, but in the Caribbean. And all of this have connected to my mentor, Pastor Miles, as actually becoming moving followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. So we are becoming agents of change in our area of gifting, mm -hmm. which is the correctional field or the community correctional field. And so they are some of our plans mm -hmm. that we have for the National League. And then you're, you're mentoring so many and you're passing those skills on to others. Yes, most definitely. How long has the North Carolina um, organization been affiliated? With Basically, you? I established the North Carolina... Oh, did? Okay, um, fine. Um, the, is this the National League Institute? North yeah. Carolina, yes. same name. Okay, yes. And I established mm -hmm. that, I got legal status of that in 2010. Mm -hmm. And then last year, we got our tax exempt status. Excellent. So now we're going to actually uh, build that up much more. And we have interns who actually work from the office. So we don't have to pay staff in the North Carolina. We just have to pay for the overhead expenses, for the offices and the apartment that they utilize. And that's what we're doing now. That is excellent. Troy, tell us, what, what can parents do to encourage their children or what advice would you give to parents of today? Well, the advice that I would give to parents is that they start becoming parents. And we have understood that children do not come with a manual. Therefore, just the same way we go to school to learn how to be doctors, lawyers, or even be electrician, carpenters, what we need to do is take on parenting skills or go to a parenting session that is done at the Department of Rehabilitative for the National Parenting Program, mm -hmm. and they can learn new skills or they can enforce the skills they already have. And then they need to start getting involved with their uh, child or their children, education, and also exactly how their children spend their free time in the community, at mm -hmm. home, on the computer. So they need, they need to be more aware of the changing trends that is happening around them and be more involved in the lives of their children. Mm -hmm. And I think once they get the skills from parenting training, parenting classes, they can actually implement those or incorporate those with their children mm -hmm. and how effectively they could be involved with their children's lives socially, spiritually, and educationally. Troy, this conversation has been most enlightening and it's really something that the Bahamas needs. And I do commend you for what you're doing in the National Lead Institute. Thank you for being our guest. Thank you for having me. We encourage you to continue watching the series, The Bahamas Then and Now. And we urge you to invite others to tune in. Thank you for watching.